Greetings and welcome. We are in 303 in Junior English, and we now turn in your hymnals to 858, 859, and the James Thurber offering, The Night the Ghost Got In. Let's turn for a few moments to page 859 and talk about this writer named James Thurber, the uh, really brilliant uh, humorist and satirist. Our dates are 894, 1894 to 1961. Let's read, please. James Thurber's essays, plays, sketches, cartoons, and short stories, I would underline or, or, or write in your notes cartoons, and short stories generally evolved from his own experiences. In his humorous sketches, Thurber embellishes facts and describes events in an amusing manner. In his short stories, Thurber's characters typically struggle against the unpleasant realities of modern life. In his pen and ink illustrations and cartoons, Thurber portrays men, women, and animals, especially dogs, facing the trials of everyday life. Our next heading is The New Yorker. Now, if you don't know about this magazine, I, I recommend that you Google it. Uh, the New Yorker is an important magazine still in our culture, in our uh, in intellectual culture today. Thurber was born in Columbus, Ohio. After attending Ohio State University, he joined the New Yorker magazine staff in 1927 as managing editor. From there, or so he claimed, he quickly worked his way down to writer. Until the end of his life, Thurber regularly contributed stories, essays, drawings, and cartoons to the magazine's pages. And by the way, if you Google um, and Google image James Thurber, you'll get a lot of these cartoons. You'll, you'll die laughing at some of these cartoons. He also worked closely with the celebrated writer E.B. White, who wrote numerous essays for the magazine. Finally, comic genius. Thurber is one of the few humorists whose work is part of the American literary canon. About his comic genius, Thurber was quite modest. Quote, he says, I write humor the way a surgeon operates because it's a livelihood, because I have a great urge to do it, because many interesting challenges are set up, and because I have the hope it may do some good, end quote. In much of his work, Thurber's humor reveals an edge of unhappiness, especially in his later years, when his failing vision caused him much pain and bitterness. Thurber's many published works include The Owl in the Attic and Other Perplexities from 1931, The Seal in the Bedroom and Other, and, uh, and Other Predicaments, 1932, Fables of Our Time, 1940, and the best-selling My World and Welcome to It, 1942. Let's go over to page 858 really quickly and look at the literary analyses there. Read with me at 2B. Um, humor appears in all forms of literature, from drama to poetry to fiction. A humorous essay is a short, funny work of nonfiction. It requires literary skill and the use of specific strategies to translate the comedy of everyday life into amusing words of write, works of writing. Humor writers use the following techniques to make written, uh, written works funny. Let's write this down. What makes humor humor? First, this is a word you'll see on the exam, so we want to make sure about it. Hyperbole. That, by the way, is the way we say the word. Hyperbole. This is exaggeration or outrageous overstatement, right? I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, we would argue is usually hyperbole. The opposite of hyperbole is understatement, right? Downplaying a dramatic event or saying less than what is meant, okay? The next one is idioms, expressions in which the literal meanings of the words do not add up to the actual meaning. Raiding cats and dogs obviously means that it's pouring outside. And finally, dialect, ways of speaking that are particular to a region or a group. We think, of course, of Mark Twain when we, when we think about this one, right? As you read, notice Thurber's use of these techniques and the ways in which they add to the essay's humor. And then finally, under uh, your reading strategy, analyzing cause and effect. Notice your, vo or your four vocabulary words as well on page um, 585. Let's turn now to page 860. I'm not going to say anything about this text. I just want you to experience it because it's the best way with James Thurber to just experience the humor of the text. We're just now going to read it in its entirety. We're not going to do any kind of stopping or anything like that. So simply flow, follow along at level one, jot down what happens. It's a very, very simple kind of essay uh, narrative that you're going to read. But at the end of it, and you want to write this down right now at level 2B, we're going to ask this question. What is funny or humorous? What is funny or humorous about this text? All right? What is funny or humorous about this text? All right? We've got professional reader. We're going to read along now. Pay attention again. We're not just 
letting someone read a story to us, but we ourselves want to be there to read the story as well, right? So let's go to it. The Night the Ghost Got In. The Night the Ghost Got In by James Thurber. The ghost that got into our house on the night of November 17, 1915, raised such a hullabaloo of misunderstandings that I am sorry I didn't just let it keep on walking and go to bed. Its advent caused my mother to throw a shoe through a window of the house next door and ended up with my grandfather shooting a patrolman. I am sorry, therefore, as I have said, that I ever paid any attention to the footsteps. They began about a quarter past one o'clock in the morning, a rhythmic, quick-cadenced walking around the dining room table. My mother was asleep in one room upstairs, my brother Herman in another, Grandfather was in the attic, in the old walnut bed, which, as you will remember, once fell on my father. I had just stepped out of the bathtub and was busily rubbing myself with a towel when I heard the steps. They were the steps of a man walking rapidly around the dining room table downstairs. The light from the bathroom shone down the back steps, which dropped directly into the dining room. I could see the faint shine of plates on the plate rail I couldn't see the table. The steps kept going round and round the table. At regular intervals, a board creaked when it was trod upon. I supposed at first that it was my father or my brother Roy who had gone to Indianapolis but were expected home at any time. I suspected next that it was a burglar. It did not enter my mind until later that it was a ghost. After the walking had gone on for perhaps three minutes, I tiptoed to Herman's room. Psst, I hissed in the dark, shaking him. Oh, he said in the low, hopeless tone of a despondent beagle. He always half suspected that something would get him in the night. I told him who I was. There's something downstairs, I said. He got up and followed me to the head of the back staircase. We listened together. There was no sound. The steps had ceased. Herman looked at me in some alarm. I had only the bath towel around my waist. He wanted to go back to bed, but I gripped his arm. There's something down there, I said. Instantly, the steps began again, circled the dining room table like a man running, and started up the stairs toward us, heavily, two at a time. The light still shone palely down the stairs. We saw nothing coming. We only heard the steps. Herman rushed to his room and slammed the door. I slammed shut the door at the stairs top and held my knee against it. After a long minute, I slowly opened it again. There was nothing there. There was no sound. None of us ever heard the ghost again. The slamming of the doors had aroused Mother. She peered out of her room. What on earth are you boys doing, she demanded. Herman ventured out of his room. Nothing, he said gruffly, but he was, in color, a light green. What was all that running around downstairs, said Mother. So she had heard the steps, too. We just looked at her. Burglars, she shouted intuitively. I tried to quiet her by starting lightly downstairs. Come on, Herman, I said. I'll stay with Mother, he said. She's all excited. I stepped back onto the landing. Don't either of you go a step, said Mother. We'll call the police. Since the phone was downstairs, I didn't see how we were going to call the police, nor did I want the police, but Mother made one of her quick, incomparable decisions. She flung up a window of her bedroom, which faced the bedroom windows of the house of a neighbor, picked up a shoe, and whammed it through a pane of glass across the narrow space that separated the two houses. Glass tinkled into the bedroom occupied by a retired engraver named Bodwell and his wife. Bodwell had been for some years in rather a bad way and was subject to mild attacks. Most everybody we knew or lived near had some kind of attacks. It was now about two o'clock of a moonless night. Clouds hung black and low. Bodwell was at the window in a minute, shouting, frothing a little, shaking his fist. We'll sell the house and go back to Peoria, we could hear Mrs. Bodwell saying. 
It was some time before Mother got through to Bodwell. Burglars, she shouted. Burglars in my house. Herman and I hadn't dared to tell her that it was not burglars, but ghosts, for she was even more afraid of ghosts than of burglars. Bodwell at first thought that she meant there were burglars in his house, but finally he quieted down and called the police for us over an extension phone by his bed. After he had disappeared from the window, Mother suddenly made as if to throw another shoe, not because there was further need of it, but, as she later explained, because the thrill of heaving a shoe through a window glass had enormously taken her fancy, I prevented her. The police were on hand in a commendably short time. A Ford sedan full of them, two on motorcycles, and a patrol wagon with about eight in it and a few reporters. They began banging at our front door. Flashlights shot streaks of gleam up and down the walls, across the yard, down the walk between our house and Bodwell's. Open up, cried a hoarse voice. We're men from headquarters. I wanted to go down and let them in, since there they were, but Mother wouldn't hear of it. You haven't a stitch on, she pointed out. You'd catch your death. I wound the towel around me again. Finally, the cops put their shoulders to our big, heavy front door with its thick, beveled glass and broke it in. I could hear a rending of wood and a splash of glass on the floor of the hall. Their lights played all over the living room and crisscrossed nervously in the dining room, stabbed into hallways, shot up the front stairs, and finally up the back. They caught me standing in my towel at the top. A heavy policeman bounded up the steps. Who are you? he demanded. I live here, I said. Well, what's the matter, you hot? He asked. I was, as a matter of fact, cold. I went to my room and pulled on some trousers. On my way out, a cop stuck a gun into my ribs. What are you doing here? He demanded. I live here, I said. The officer in charge reported to Mother. No sign of nobody, lady, he said. Must have got away. What'd he look like? There were two or three of them, Mother said whooping and carrying on and slamming doors. Funny, said the cop. All your windows and doors was locked on the inside tight as a tick. Downstairs, we could hear the tromping of the other police. Police were all over the place. Doors were yanked open, drawers were yanked open, windows were shot up and pulled down, furniture fell with dull thumps. A half dozen policemen emerged out of the darkness of the front hallway upstairs. They began to ransack the floor, pulled beds away from walls, tore clothes off hooks in the closets, pulled suitcases and boxes off shelves. One of them found an old zither that Roy had won in a pool tournament. Looky here, Joe, he said, strumming it with a big paw. The cop named Joe took it and turned it over. What is it? he asked me. It's an old zither our guinea pig used to sleep on, I said. It was true that a pet guinea pig we once had would never sleep anywhere except on the zither, but I should never have said so. Joe and the other cop looked at me a long time. They put the zither back on a shelf. No sign of nothing, said the cop who had first spoken to Mother. This guy, he explained to the others, jerking a thumb at me, was naked. The lady seems historical. They all nodded but said nothing, just looked at me. In the small silence, we all heard a creaking in the attic. Grandfather was turning over in bed. What's that? snapped Joe. Five or six cops sprang for the attic door before I could intervene or explain. I realized that it would be bad if they burst in on Grandfather unannounced, or even announced. He was going through a phase in which he believed that General Meade's men, under steady hammering by Stonewall Jackson, were beginning to retreat and even desert. When I got to the attic, things were pretty confused. Grandfather had evidently jumped to the conclusion that the police were deserters from Meade's army, trying to hide away in his attic. He bounded out of bed wearing a long flannel nightgown over long woolen underwear, a nightcap, and a leather jacket around his chest. The cops must have realized at once that the indignant white-haired old man belonged in the house, but they had no chance to say so. Back, ye cowardly dogs, roared Grandfather. Back to the lines, ye yellow lily-livered cattle. 
With that, he fetched the officer who found the zither a flat-handed smack alongside his head that sent him sprawling. The others beat a retreat, but not fast enough. Grandfather grabbed Zither's gun from its holster and let fly. The report seemed to crack the rafters. Smoke filled the attic. A cop cursed and shot his hand to his shoulder. Somehow, we all finally got downstairs again and locked the door against the old gentleman. He fired once or twice more in the darkness and then went back to bed. That was Grandfather. I explained to Joe out of breath. He thinks you're deserters. I'll say he does, said Joe. The cops were reluctant to leave without getting their hands on somebody besides Grandfather. The night had been distinctly a defeat for them. Furthermore, they obviously didn't like the layout. Something looked, and I can see their viewpoint, phony. They began to poke into things again. A reporter, a thin-faced wispy man, came up to me. I had put on one of Mother's blouses, not being able to find anything else. The reporter looked at me with mingled suspicion and interest. Just what the heck is the real lowdown here, bud? He asked. I decided to be frank with him. We had ghosts, I said. He gazed at me a long time as if I were a slot machine into which he had, without results, dropped a nickel. Then he walked away. The cops followed him the one grandfather shot holding his now bandaged arm, cursing and blaspheming. I'm gonna get my gun back from that old bird, said the zither cop. Yeah, said Joe, you and who else? I told them I would bring it to the station house the next day. What was the matter with that one policeman, mother asked after they had gone. Grandfather shot him, I said. What for, she demanded. I told her he was a deserter. Of all things, said Mother. He was such a nice-looking young man. Grandfather was fresh as a daisy and full of jokes at breakfast next morning. We thought at first he had forgotten all about what had happened, but he hadn't. Over his third cup of coffee, he glared at Herman and me. What was the idea of all them cops Terry hooting round the house last night, he demanded. He had us there. Okay, let's talk for a second about this story and, uh, it, it, you know, ask, okay, what's humorous about this story? Now, let's point out that humor has changed over time. Can we say this for our notes? Humor has changed over time. It says something to a lot of my junior students that this is a story which once passed as really funny. Okay, I'm always interested when uh, we do this story with juniors and they kind of look at it as, well, it seems kind of like just a silly story. What makes this story humorous? Maybe we should ask it this way. If we look at this text as a work of historical fiction, when it was written and enjoyed in another time in American culture, this was a considerable funny story. But we have to kind of ask the question, why? Well, let's begin by just of all jotting down, we clearly can kind of summarize at level one, can't we? This is a story about some kind of an intruder of a kind, maybe an assumed intruder, which ultimately leads to all kind of craziness happening from shoes being thrown through windows to cops being shot in shoulders by grandpa sleeping in the attic and then, you know, all, all the, all the uh, stuff that goes along with that, right? But let's ask this question, what would make this whole story more unbelievable today. That is to say, yeah, this this does not this does not go down this way today. Well, some students will point out right away, well, first of all, no policeman would allow to be shot by an old grandpa sleeping in an attic, and are you ready for this? His firearm to be left left and the police just walk out the door. That tells you all you need to know about it being a different time, right? I mean, obviously. Also, everyone shows up. A journalist shows up wanting to do interviews with this kid and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, none of that would be allowed today either, right? Let's ask, though, about the, at level, uh, at level 2B, let's ask about this as a humorous essay. An example of hyperbole, exaggeration, 
or understatement, right? You can go through the story and find all kinds of examples of idioms and obviously the dialect, especially when the police are talking uh, back and forth, okay? If we were to work at level 2A and the whole notion of themes, messages, we would point out that this is a little bit different than some of the titles we've been working with. We would begin by pointing out that this is a text designed to entertain. Well, what makes it funny? Well, obviously it's all about cause and effect, right? So in other words, some things lead to other things which lead to other things. And even though this is not considered by many of my junior students today a very funny story, they certainly at level three can start to think about similar kinds of situations where a single misunderstanding led to another misunderstanding, led to a third misunderstanding, and in the end, all kinds of strange, funny things happen because of a single misunderstanding, and so we can easily think that way. Cause and effect, that is to say, one thing leads to another thing. Right. Of course, you do have youth and old age games being played here. You also have, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the eccentric uh, with the normal, right, in terms of the eccentric being the grandpa especially, right? If we were to jump to uh, 2B really quickly and ask about this as a work of humor, we could point out that Thurber is trying to play a little bit of a game with us where he says oftentimes the most innocent of beginnings can lead to all kinds of crazy events which happen. And this, of course, is normal life. It's the way it actually works in real life, right? You might ask it this way as well at 2B. What is your favorite character of all the different characters of the story? Some of my students say they really love this grandpa. They'd like to know more about him, right? And this whole thing about he's hallucinating and then he's ready to take shots at a cop, you know, and all of that. If we work at 3A, let's ask this question. What is for you your favorite example of a funny movie? What constitutes your favorite funny movie? Go ahead and write that one down. And then more interestingly, answer this question. How does your favorite funny movie differ from a story like